as well. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we could, absolutely. So let's begin our conversation. And, and I know we're all getting fatigued by talking about COVID, but it was such a big event for all of us to live through. How did you survive the pandemic and how has it changed the way that you do things now? So I, I sort of cheated. I'd been working from home for years. Yeah. Just my, I, I figured out a long time ago that, that that's where I can be most effective. And, you know, this, this stuff of virtual meetings and all this stuff, I'd been doing that for years. Um, so when the world switched to that mode, it's like, oh, this is Tuesday, you know, that, that kind of thing. It's just, it, it was, it was that part of it was very normal for me. Yeah. The rest of it, um, you know, not, not going out to grocery stores, not taking my wife out to dinner, that stuff got old really fast and running out of toilet paper, right? You know, that yeah. stuff got old. Um, and then also caring for people around me for whom the transition was tougher psychologically because they weren't used to working from, you know, an office in their home yeah. day in, day out and loving it, right? Yeah. Uh, and if suddenly that's where you are, instead of going, you know, you know, going to the office and seeing people and meeting people and that, if that's where you are, that was a tough thing to deal with. So I tried to be sensitive to that and, and work with people. So, so, I mean, it, it was, I, I would say it was easier for me um, than it was for a lot of people just because of my, uh, of working from home. But I also had a, a, a granddaughter who was in uh, junior high school and she missed a whole year of school trying to do it from a computer. And she, I mean, she spends all day long on, you know, social media and stuff like that, but learning in that environment was really hard on her. Yeah. So. And I think the younger generations took it the worst. I mean, I think it just cutting them off from all of that emotional, social connection yeah. was right was when they're trying to form that stuff, right? Yeah. Right. When you're trying to figure out who you are as a kid, uh -huh. right, as a person, yeah. and then you don't have any people that you can reach yeah. out and touch and, you know, throw a ball to or, take to a dance or something. It, it was hard. It was yeah, very hard. Definitely was. So let's get to the heart. And so on paper, you're an author and a coach. But if I put you in front of a bunch of third grade students at career day, and one of the kids was curious and said, hey, what do you do for a living? How do you answer them? I would once run screaming from the room. <laughs> um, no, it, it would. I would I would tell them that I'm a, a coach. I coach. Um, I'm a superpower coach. Actually, uh, third graders would relate to that. Sure. Uh, so I teach something that I think of as, and this is jargony. I wouldn't use this with third graders because I'm taking the question literally. Um, but uh, I normalize, I help people normalize the impossible. Uh, I, we, we, we live our lives with, uh, we, we, most of us were given these blinders pretty yeah. much at birth. I know I, I can still remember people telling me, uh, be realistic you know, set a realistic goal. Don't expect too much. You won't be disappointed. And that's just crap. Yeah. I wouldn't say that to third graders, but it's right. just crap. Yeah. And uh, so what I do is I, I teach people that it life is actually easier if you set bigger goals, huge goals, goals that you think are impossible. You actually believe they're impossible for you. And all that is, is you saying, I can't do this. I'm not capable of doing this. What I do is help people change their perspective, their frame of mind, and say, well, what if you gained capabilities? And it, it sounds strange, but most people don't think in those terms. It just doesn't occur to them. They've yeah. done it time and time and time again in their lives. And, and, and the, the third grade piece is actually a really nice way to bring this out. We've all gone through these impossible uh, goal achievements since we were, almost since we were born. Yeah. When you're nine months old crawling around on the ground, it's physically impossible for you to walk. It's emotionally impossible. It's psychologically impossible. What do you do? You walk. What was impossible became easy. Yeah. Okay, that's a special case. That doesn't count. Well, how about when you learn to talk, when yeah. you learn to walk, when you learn to read, when you learn to write, right in the middle of what third graders are going through, right? Uh, as, as they're learning all these things that a couple of years ago, if you had older siblings, you, you saw them doing stuff and it's like, I can't do that. That's impossible. And then you did it and then it became easy riding yeah. a bike driving a car and so when i'm talking to entrepreneurs you know let's switch the frame for a second uh and they're going yeah yeah but that's you know that's when you're a kid none of that counts that doesn't really matter uh, i always say okay was there ever a time in your life because because my focus is successful entrepreneurs that's who i that's my sweet spot that's my ideal customer uh they have a mentality that's wonderful to work with because they this <laughs> 
<laughs> they don't think I'm batshit crazy. Let's put it that way, right? Yeah. They, they, they think it's a little bit out there, but they realize, I want, I want to hear what this guy has to say. Yeah. Not everybody else in the world does. So um, I, I, I look an entrepreneur right in the eye, and I, I say, okay, um, was there ever a time in your life when you were earning 10 times less than what you're earning now? And everybody goes, of course there was. You know, I had a paper out. I was mowing grass. Did you think then that what you have now would be possible? Of course not. It's absurd, right. ridiculous, but you achieved it. So now you have in your own life an evidence procedure that proves to you that you've gone from what was impossible to what was possible and even easy because you added capabilities. You grew. It's all about growth as far as I'm concerned. That's my, my highest value as far as human development is growth. That's yeah. what I think we're put on the planet to do, to grow and help others. But you help others by growing. And and. Uh, that's what I teach. So, so for the back to the kids, <laughs> shift the frame back. I would, I would tell them, you know, you're doing, you're in your sweet spot now. You're, you're growing. You're learning to grow. This is the one of the coolest times of your life. You'll be growing more than you even realize at this point. But you get to enjoy it all. And I get to teach people how to do what you're doing. I get to teach adults how to do what yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Um, so that's brilliant. What great illustrative examples. So. I'm curious, when you were in the third grade, what did you want to be when you grew up? What was your dream? I have a, uh, when I was in third grade, I was in England. Okay. Um, my, my, I, I was raised by a single mom uh, who had four boys. I mean, that, that doesn't compute, right? Right. <laughs> this, this was back at a time when being a single parent was not a, a thing. You did that sure. was society, just what happened to her? You know, what's, what's the matter with her? Yeah. What's the matter with them? Um, <laughs> and, and, so she she was on, uh, got a Fulbright scholarship, brilliant, brilliant person, dragged her kids to England. She went to school in London. We were in this private school. And um, so I was just trying to stay above water at that point. Yeah. Um, it, cultural immersion and all this other stuff. Fortunately, we, we spoke a similar language. Yeah. Uh, uh, what did Ch Churchill say? We are, we are two people separated by a common language. Yeah, uh, that that's kind of that's kind of what it felt like. Uh, but all in all, it was a great time. But I wasn't thinking about what I wanted to be sure. as a kid. I understand the question. I just it's a that's a that's a chunk of my life that's just ironic since you you point yeah. that out. Um, I, I always wanted to be in politics. I was absolutely convinced I was going to be president of the United States. Wow. Um, until I grew up and realized I have <laughs> I, I'm fascinated with politics, but I'm not a politician. I'm yeah. not, uh, if, if somebody asks me a question, I'm going to tell them what I think. Yeah. Um, I, I spent my life in sales and I would tell people the truth. And I used to get beaten up by that, by sales management. And it's, it, it's like, you guys don't understand. It's the most powerful tool you've got. Yeah. The, the, the world is full of everybody who's trying to put something over on you. Yeah. So you show up as telling people the truth and it's like, I'm going to do business with this guy. Yeah. Um, and that would have been my approach to politics, and I probably would have crashed and burned. But anyway, it, uh, I, I just realized, you know, so, somewhere around my 20s, this is not the career path. So. Yeah, yeah. I used to have people tell me that, and I'm like, I, uh -uh, that's not, there's a whole different acumen that goes into that. And a lot of it, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, is dishonest. It just yeah. is. It's yeah. disingenuous. It's saying what people want to hear yeah. and then doing something different. And it's not cool. It's like it, the karmic cash register is just imbalanced at that point. Yeah. And yeah, that's no way to do it. So what's the best quote you've ever, or best advice you've ever gotten in your life? <laughs> um, years ago, back to football, this guy named Kenny Stabler, Snake Stabler. Uh -huh. uh, he played for uh, what was then Oakland, the Raiders, yep. and then LA, and then Oakland. Um, and he was asked one day, some egghead um, sports writer asked him some long, convoluted question. Um, Mr. Stabler, what, whatever you know, what would you know, if somebody were asking you for advice? about how to deal with, you know, the, the existential crisis of living and all this whole long thing. He waits for the guy to finish. He says, so what would your advice be? And Stabler goes, throw deep. <laughs> and I've always, that I, I, sounds crazy. I heard this when I was a kid, it, it, it stuck with me. And the weird thing is that's what this book is about. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's about throwing deep. Yeah. 
Um, and I wish I wish I could find that story. I probably should probably available on the internet um, because it was it was in some books and stuff. Because it's it's just a funny thing. You just yeah, it's going on and on and on about how would you know what would you do? throw deep? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just love that. That's so, great. That, that's the answer. See, you got me wanting to look that up. I'm going to look it up when we're done. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's great. So, who's been a hero for you? Who's been an inspiration for you in your life? I have lots of them. So, yeah. uh, I'm. Uh, I said I was interested in politics. Still, am interested in politics uh, and history. Always been fascinated with history. So, um, Abraham Lincoln, yeah, Winston Churchill, uh, definite heroes of mine. Um, I've also been a success junkie essentially my entire adult life. Uh, I'm just fascinated. My, my mission in life is to develop my potential. Yeah. And to do that by helping others develop theirs. It's sort of this little two for thing, right? Yeah. The way I get to where I want to get is by helping others get to where they want to get. So I've done lots of research, attended lots of seminars, asked a lot of really smart people questions, you know, tried to learn what I could learn. So I've been fascinated with that. So I have some, some, virtual mentors sometimes i i know them sometimes i don't but but they're mentors nonetheless in my life so those would include people like dan sullivan uh who's a brilliant entrepreneurial coach um has a company called strategic coach um tony robbins uh you know he, there's lots of hype around tony but tony's the real deal yeah <laughs> tony's got some incredible wisdom yeah. uh, and i've known him uh, and of him and uh, been a student of his for many years yeah. Uh, and also a student of the people he learned from in, in uh, what, what, he, what was then called neurolinguistics, which sort of got a bad name. Um, but the people who created that also fascinated me, and I learned from them. So, so th there, are, uh, there are lots of people in what I would call, I guess, the personal development space that are heroes to me. Yeah. Um, as well as, you know, the historical figures and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and then, you know, at the top of the list is my wife. So Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, so let me ask you this of all of the companies that exist on the planet right now, what's one that you admire from the way that they treat employees to their profit margins, to their overall vibe, what, which one sways you the most? Um, you're, you're asking a question that is, um, that's hard for me to answer. Um, because there are, I I've dealt with a lot of, um, large companies. And I don't have one of them that I would, if we're being honest here, actually say they, they fill that bill. Um, I think I'm more, and this is probably one of the reasons I enjoy working with entrepreneurs. I think entrepreneurial companies are more likely to do that. I know some, I know some small, um, some small companies. Uh, there's a company in Kansas city called Rao construction. Yeah. Um, Small family built business been around for, I don't know, close to a hundred years, I think, um, close to that. Um, uh, just wonderful people who take care of their employees and take care of their customers. And they just have a neat, a neat vibe. Uh, uh, so that's an example of a, of a small company. Um, so, so it's, it's a question I struggle with because I have, uh, worked with large companies. I ended up with a couple of large companies, entirely not my fault. Um, I worked for small companies. Well, there's, there's a good example. There's a company called lynda.com. Yeah. I worked for, they were in the, um, the e-learning space. They were one of the pioneers that have built what has become this huge space. And they hired me to start this new mar market segment for them. And so I got to join them when they were still a small entrepreneurial kind of company and they were wonderful. They, they had values, they lived their values people felt that they were value. It was, it was a great environment. They were bought by LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn was um, essentially kept the Linda vibe and just did that. And I was, I didn't want to have anything to do with a larger company because I like smaller companies and they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I stayed there. Um, and then LinkedIn was bought by Microsoft. Yeah. I didn't want to stay there. They made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I stayed there. And both of those companies, LinkedIn and Microsoft, have some have some wonderful philosophies driving them. Yeah, philosophies don't always in a company that large don't always get down to where the rubber meets the road, and that's that's why I have trouble answering this question. Yeah, because I've seen too much of both. I've seen people saying really good things at the senior management level, um, and then people 
who are line level managers who don't listen to any of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I get sorry. it. I totally that's what that's what I got. <laughs> no, that's a good answer. No, and every answer is totally valid and that's great. I love that. So what is your driving force every day that gets you out of bed that gets you to do the work that you do? You have to give a lot for your clients to to achieve what they can do in their lives, but you also have to evolve as a human. What yeah. is that collective gumption for you? Well, so the two are linked, as I said, from I have a personal mission statement and that sounds like that sounds like I'm you know, putting something on the wall, like a corporate mission statement that you put on the wall, nobody ever looks at, right? That's not the way this evolved. This, I, I was trying to figure out what I was about, what I, I was actually trying to, to answer the question you just asked me. You know, what, what brings you joy? What gets you up in the morning? And the, the, the answer that rose to the top, and there were lots of components to this, was to, to grow, to become uh, now I sound like an army advertisement to become all that I could be right yeah. as a, as a human being, but do that by helping others do that, yeah. not just helping others. Um, I don't want to give somebody a fish. I want to teach them how to fish. If I learn how to fish, and and that's sort of my that's what gets me up in the morning: learning something new, talking to somebody new, new trying something new, creating something new, and seeing if it works. Um, and then if it works for me or my clients sharing that as broadly as I can share that. That's what gets me up in the morning. So I'm on this mad, passionate mission to do exactly that. I, I would love everybody to understand that they can achieve impossible goals. That's what I teach people how to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm literal about it. This isn't a figure of speech. I mean, yeah. you, I can show you how you can achieve something impossible. Now, not everybody's ready to do that. Yeah, this, the, I mean, I, I, I struggle with trying to understand that. And at some point you kind of say, you know, people are people. Yeah, you just you work with what you got. And, and if you if you put this out there and say, I've got this thing for you and here's lots of evidence about how it works and here's some explanation about how it works. And if they go, oh, that's nice. See you later. I mean, how many people do you know who've gotten a useful book? And they either put it in the shelf and don't read it or they read it and put it in the shelf and then go to the next useful book. Yeah. And the next and the next. And I actually am trying to do more than that. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get people to actually make this idea live in their lives because the, the potential is just staggering what could happen if, if more and more people really grasp this. So on your path to becoming a coach, a super coach, I want to know what was the first client, the moment, the sparkle in someone's eye where you knew that you were doing what you needed to do with your life? Um, this, it wasn't then, it wasn't this iteration. It goes back a ways. I wrote a book um, called The Magic Lamp, Goal Setting for People Who Hate Setting Goals. Yeah. And I wrote it because I hated setting goals. But as a, success junkie, I knew I had to set goals. It yeah. just didn't work for me. It killed spontaneity. It wasn't fun. I hated hated the discipline, I guess is the word. So I wrote I wrote this book for myself because I was in the shower one day and I probably just seen the movie Aladdin or something related to it. And I was thinking, you know, it would be so great if goal setting was like, you know, making a wish, yeah. making your wishes come true. And I almost slipped on a bar of soap. It was like, Yes. It was one of those aha moments you read about. Yeah. Jumped out of the shower dripping wet. I always have a notepad near where, wherever I am. So I started writing out this idea and I came up with this model called the lamp model, which was, which was how to make your wishes come true. Yeah. The difference being you are your own genie, right? Yeah. And people say, yeah, but you know, the great thing about a genie is the genie's doing all the work. And my, my answer to that is that's what's wrong with a genie. The yeah. genie's doing all the work. You don't get to do any of the growing. Yeah. You, and, and, that, and that's the juice of life, growing. So w when that first happened, uh, I was uh, uh, consulting with a little software company, and they wanted to become a big software company. And um, we did some magic with, it, with this stuff. Uh, and it was just at the right time, the right moment. And they went uh, public a few years later in one of the biggest software IPOs in history. Yeah. Not, not, and I'm not taking credit for that. Sure. It, it's, it was answering your question of when I realized 
this is what I wanted to do. This is how I can have an impact because I happen to have this bizarre flash of idea, intuition, whatever you want to call it. It it always seems like magic to me when that happens. And I'm sure it's happened to you. Um, I had this flash of something and I turned it into a book and I turned it into an idea and then it started changing lives. Um, And I realized this is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I need to do more of this. Yeah. So of all of these things that you've done and accomplished in your life, what are you the proudest of? My family. Yeah. And I didn't accomplish it. I mean, if I'm being fair, they, they accomplished me. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've grown most from my interaction with my kids and now my granddaughter and, uh, and my wife, uh, sometimes kicking and screaming growth. Um, but it's the, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And, and it's the most important thing that's ever happened to me. So it, that's the center of my universe. Um, and I, I, like I said, I don't think of it as an achievement, but it's the thing I'm most proud of. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So if ever, everybody out there has an idea of who they think you are, there's different pockets of people, family, friends, clients, everyone that reads your books, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? back to that uh, mission idea. I'm somebody who is um, absolutely fascinated with learning and growing myself and sharing what I learn with other people. That That's how I think of myself. I would hope the people you just described would also understand that's who I am, but but that's, that's who I think I am. Yeah. That, that's the answer to the question. And, and and by the way, that's also who I want to be. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, I know in my business life, I've been around supervisors where there's just been a moment where I've been in their office and they're they're doing something before they're meeting with me. And I get a glimpse. You get those raw glimpses into who they are. If you could be in the Oval Office or be in a room with the president <laughs> and feel that without them addressing or doing anything presidential or political, just being them. Who would you love to be a fly on the wall and witness them doing what they're doing? Uh, actually, I would watch. This, sorry, this all comes back to to the same center spot for me. I would watch how they interact with the people they're closest to, their family, their yeah. loved ones. Um, because the the piece that gets lost in in any um, separation from a human being to being famous to being on stage is the humanity. Yeah. And we're all looking to, to connect with somebody. So you, you have a favorite TV show, probably because there's a character in it that you connect with. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you want to be that person, or maybe you just would like to hang out with that person, right? So politicians try desperately to create an image, you know, of somebody that you'd want to have a beer with, you know. Um, but some of them are um, behind the scenes. Some of them actually are that kind of person. Yeah. And you can, the, the only way you can really tell that is behind the scenes. Yeah. The only way you can understand the authenticity is when they aren't trying to present this, this face because anything, I mean, that's, that's our problem as, as um, consumers of this, if you will. Uh, we assume it's all fake. Yeah. We assume there's no authenticity in it, right? So it almost doesn't matter what, the people in front of us are doing our stars or politicians or athletes it almost doesn't matter we think they're fake yeah um and the the moment when they aren't fake is when they're around their family or when uh in how they deal with people who are their quote-unquote inferiors right so the doorman the you know the the security cop that lets people into the building that kind of stuff are they human beings do they care about these people yeah if they don't I'm not interested in them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. That, I mean, I, I might, who knows? I might vote for them for policies. Who knows? But uh, those are the things that tell me something about people. And also in the little glimpses you have, like you said, you walk into somebody's office. That that tells you a lot. You know, yeah. some guy's talking to an underling and, and choose this guy out. You know, <laughs> you know, this guy's an asshole, right? He doesn't. Uh-huh. He doesn't need to wear a T-shirt that says I'm an asshole. He just showed you. He just is. So yeah. He just, yeah, he just is, right? Yeah. So let's be fantastical on the way out here. I'm going to, when we get off this call, Time Machine pulls up in front of your house. You can go anywhere in the history of time and see one event with your own eyes. 
where are you going to go? Uh, I would see Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. Okay. I had a feeling it was going to be Lincoln, but I, I didn't know what moment. So, yeah, that, that, would, that would be amazing. So I got to know, what's the best speech you've ever seen in your life? The best speech? Yeah. As in political speech? Or just in general, just a speech someone gave that was just mind-blowing. Um, I'm trying to parse that because the, the sp speech always seems like a formal thing to me. Somebody's going to, you know, I'm, I'm now speaking down from the on high to give you this. Um, I've heard some great sermons in church. Yeah. Um, are those speeches, you know, call them whatever you want. Um, I've... I go back historically. I mean, there, there. If if you're a Churchill fan, Churchill led a nation at a really trying time. Yeah, and and sort of provided them almost by by will with a backbone necessary to fight what was a classic impossible fight. There was no yeah. way that Britain was going to beat Nazi Germany, right? Yeah. No way. Yeah. Um. Um. And yet, we know we know what happened and how it happened. But Churchill would do these um, speeches that were then broadcast. He was really talking into a radio. It's closer to a podcast than a speech, right? Yeah. Uh, and they were magical and amazing. And the, and the command of the language, I, I, would, I would have to say that he and Lincoln, I never heard Lincoln speak, obviously, but I've read his speeches. Uh, the two of them had the greatest command of the language. Yeah. Um, for convincing people uh, that I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, so it, were, were I to be in politics, those would be two examples I would try to follow. Yeah. So if anyone out there wants to get your books, they want to reach out, hire you, any of the good business, where do they go? KeithEllis.com. K-E-I-T-H-E-L-L-I-S.com. Easy enough. Simple. Wonderful. Keith, this has been wonderful. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your, Thank your you. time. Thank you. This was delightful. Yeah, absolutely was. Thank you. Best of luck with everything. Good luck here up there. I'm sure it's going to get more intense up there in the Beltway. So best of luck with everything. Love the map, by the way. Very cool. Oh, oh thank you. Yeah, I, I'm a visual artist. So that's one of my originals. It's my my wife's an English teacher. So it's in her room right now. So yeah, it's it, uh, it, it's it's very, it, it's it's neat. Um, it really is neat. And it it, uh, it brings the it brings the eye in at the same time that it's creating an impressionistic view of something that matters a lot to us all absolutely right? united states so it's very yeah. cool I yeah like it. cool anyway, i appreciate th it thank you for this this is great some wonderful questions too thank you sir i appreciate it. yeah it's been wonderful thank you